Salahuddin Part 2 Shifting Tides The main streets of Cairo. People are gathered on both sides to celebrate the victory of the Muslims against the Crusaders. The victorious Zengid army is marching toward the royal palace of the Fatimid Caliph. People are screaming with joy and showering the soldiers with flowers. At the head of the marching army is the general Shirku, and just behind him rides Salahuddin, the young hero, head held high with pride and honor. But little does he know what is about to unfold in the coming months. Once Shirku and his commanders reached the Fatimid court, the caliph, Al-Adid, greeted them with great joy and generosity. He offered Shirku the role of the Grand Vizier of Egypt. Shirku took this offer without hesitation, but he hasn't forgotten about the betrayal of Shawar. And he knew perfectly well that if he lets Shawar free, he will plot to strike back again. So Shirku's first command was to arrest Shawar and execute him. It was also a warning to everyone. Anyone who dares to side with the Crusaders will only meet one end. Death. Shirku was a man who enjoyed food and frequently arranged lavish feasts for his guests. On one such occasion, after feasting on a large meal, Shirku fell ill. The illness soon proved to be fatal. Shirku died only two months after he became the vizier. Salahuddin lost his beloved uncle and trusted mentor. Now he had to stand on his own without Shirku's support and guidance. As Salahuddin mourned the death of his uncle, Shirku, the leaders or emirs of different factions and military groups from both the Fatimid side and the Zengid side started arguing about who would be the next vizier of Egypt. The Fatimids wanted a weak vizier so that he could not gather much political influence. Electing a strong Sunni vizier wouldn't show particular strength of the Shia Caliphate, whereas the Zengids pushed for a strong leader as the vizier so that they can have a solid influence on the Fatimid Caliphate and its inner politics. The arguments went on for days. Then, one day, a messenger arrived at the court. He brought a letter from Nur din In that letter, Nur din recommended Salahuddin as Shirku's successor and requested Caliph al-Adid to appoint Salahuddin as the vizier. After all, Salahuddin's family had been of great service for many years to both Nur din and al-Adid. The Fatimid emirs supported this nomination as they thought Salahuddin was young and inexperienced. They thought he would easily fall in the role of vizier. On the other hand, the Zengid emirs saw Salahuddin's leadership on the battlefield and believed they could put trust in his abilities, so they agreed to the proposal as well. As a result, Salahuddin became the de facto ruler of Egypt, the Grand Vizier of the Fatimid Caliphate at the age of 30 in early 1169. Salahuddin had never had such power and independence before but he was still in a tug of war between the Fatimid Caliphate and the Abbasid Caliphate through Nur din And as we have discussed before, these two caliphates, one Shia and the other Sunni, were never on friendly terms. So Salahuddin now had the problem of split loyalty. As the vizier, he owed his loyalty to the Fatimid Caliphate in Egypt. At the same time, as the general of Nur din he owed his loyalty to the Zengid dynasty and thereby to the Abbasid Caliphate in Baghdad. This actually made it very difficult for Salahuddin to do what he wanted to do, help the people, unite the people, and free the holy lands from the crusaders. Soon after his appointment as the vizier, the internal political conflict in Egypt started to weigh heavy on Salahuddin. He tried to focus his mind on rebuilding the Egyptian nation. He commissioned several hospitals and madrasas, which are kind of like universities by modern standards. He started investing in improving infrastructure and defense of major Egyptian cities. One evening, Salahuddin was busy in his study thinking about his plan for the nation, when there was a sudden knock on the door, followed by several loud knocks. Salahuddin ordered the person to come in. It was Ali bin Sufyan, the chief of his bodyguards. He brought grave news. Some emirs of Egypt had decided to stage a revolt and assassinate Salahuddin in the dark of the night. Salahuddin suspected that he would not have the full support of the emirs of Egypt who did not like a Sunni vizier under the Shia Fatimid Caliphate, but he never expected that they would plot to kill him. Salahuddin was saddened. He had just started a few months ago. What had he done to deserve such treachery? But he had to control his emotions. He had to act fast 
before the rebels could strike first. He ordered his own bodyguards to capture the main conspirator, a high official for the Fatimid palace. He was immediately arrested and executed. Yet it was not sufficient to completely stop the rebellion. The following day, several other Fatimid emirs with almost 50,000 soldiers started a revolt in different parts of Egypt. Salahuddin now had a civil war on his hands. As the civil war continued, the number of the wounded and the corpses piled up. After several months of fighting, the rebel emirs started to fall one after another. It took Salahuddin almost six months to completely quell the uprising. No mercy was shown to the rebel leaders. They either fell in battle or were executed. It was a hard lesson for the Egyptian emirs. Never again would anyone dare to rise against Salahuddin in Egypt. Salahuddin's swift and resolute actions saved Egypt from a long and bloody civil war. And he learned his lesson well. He started to rebuild his court, appointed trustworthy family members and friends in important roles of state. Besides this, he also started appointing people based on their skills and merits and not because of their lineage and influence. This way, Salahuddin gradually created a strong and trusted inner council of his own. This solidified Salahuddin's political position in the Fatimid court. Now he could again focus on rebuilding the nation. Hardly three months had passed in peace, then disaster struck again. Towards the end of 1169, the crusader states of the Byzantine Empire joined forces and sent a massive naval fleet to invade Egypt. They were approaching fast to attack an Egyptian port city, Demietta. Salahuddin had actually been working to strengthen the fortification of different parts of Egypt since he came to power, expecting an attack from the crusaders. But he did not expect the attack to come from the Mediterranean Sea. He thought the crusaders would invade on land through the Sinai Peninsula, as they had done before. So, Salahuddin's main defense force was stationed much further south than Damietta. This meant it would take some time to send reinforcements to the port city. So, he had to find a way to delay the invasion. He sent a messenger to the governor of Damietta asking him to block the entrance from the sea, so that the naval fleets could not come inside the defensive line. He wrote to them that the reinforcements were already on their way. Simultaneously, he commanded his army to march towards Damietta. Upon receiving news from Salahuddin, the defenders in Damietta strengthened the city defense and raised an iron chain across the city's branch of the Nile. This prevented the crusader ships from entering the harbor from the sea and launching the attack. The crusaders decided to blockade the city from the sea. This is exactly what Salahuddin anticipated. He could now send supplies easily to the city through the Nile and reinforcements could reach the city from the southern side without confronting the enemy. The crusaders realized they couldn't take the city as easily as they had thought. They began regular siege tactics and started deploying siege weapons to attack the city defense. They built catapults, siege towers, and ballistae. But the defenders of Damietta were able to defend one wave of crusader attack after another. This was possible as they were getting regular supplies of food, arms, and men. From time to time, the defenders even went offensive to put pressure on the crusader front lines. On one occasion, they even sent a fire ship down the river into the Byzantine fleet. As soon as it reached the fleet, the explosives stored inside the fire ship detonated, causing a huge explosion. Six Byzantine warships were completely destroyed, and several others were damaged beyond repair. On several occasions, the defenders also rallied outside of the city walls, attacking the siege lines and destroying the siege engines that were pounding on the city walls. After several weeks of failed attempts to capture Damietta, the crusaders started to run out of food and other supplies. Their plan to launch a swift and surprise attack on Egypt had utterly failed. There would be no way now to continue the invasion without suffering huge casualties. The war would drain their treasury dry, and the riches that they had planned to plunder from Egypt were now out of reach. So after almost two months of laying siege on Damietta, the crusaders decided to withdraw and leave Egypt. Although the battles at the siege of Damietta were not as intense as other invasions by the crusaders, the failure of combined Byzantine and crusader forces to take a single Egyptian port city was actually a heavy blow to the morale of the crusaders. This victory proved Salahuddin's capable leadership. It would be another five years before Egypt faced another external threat. 
Salahuddin now had the resources and support in Egypt to continue his master plan. Join us next time as we explore further consolidation of Salahuddin's power in Egypt and his struggle to unite the Muslim nations under one banner against the Crusaders. Stay tuned.